Um, to be with you here this morning. Um, if you think I have an accent, I don't have an accent. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if you're conscious of this, but if you come to a country uh, before you're 17 years old, they say that you lose your accent. And if you come after 17 years old, you don't uh, lose your accent. <coughs> And I was just, um, one of the things I love to do in my own disciplines as it relates to uh, intimacy with God, uh, is I listen to the scriptures. In fact, if you really want to know, because I'm glad Janice is not here, uh, and I'll tell you why, uh, because um, I had to learn English. I was brought up in a village in South Africa where my people said, uh, the Dutch came in 1652, and I had the privilege of lecturing in the Netherlands every two years. And when I'm amongst the Dutch, I say to them, they wear wooden shoes, and they've got wooden heads, and they wouldn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> but the Dutch came in 62, and then the German settlers came to South Africa when I was born and brought up. Uh, and now then the French uh, Huguenots came in 1763. 276 of them, and then the German settlers came, and then 1820, the British settlers came, and my people say, that's when the trouble started. <laughs> so, because of, because of that, I, uh, I was brought up in a village close to Mozambique, or a town, uh, where we didn't want to speak uh, English. And so when I became a Christian, uh, and God began to speak to me about Scotland uh, and the British Isles, I had to learn the language, and an old pastor gave me an old translation of the Bible. Oh. And, um, and, you know, I was saved in a theological school at the end of my first year in South Africa, and he gave me this old translation of the Bible. And I said to him, so what translation is this? Oh, he said, it's the old King James version of the Bible. If it was good enough for Paul, it should be good enough for you. <laughs> uh, dear me. But you know, you know what I did, brother and sister? I, I spent the first seven years listening. I got the Old and, uh, uh, the, old and New Testament in those days. Of course, we had no CDs. Anyone who's late, $50 in the <laughs> <laughs> You just made it up. Sorry. There you are. You know, uh, 40 years ago, we don't had CDs and all this technology today that you're dealing with. And so what I did those days, I got myself the Old and the New Testament and cassette. And I made a commitment of the first 90 minutes of every day listen through the Old Testament on audio. In the last 45 minutes of every night, I listened to the New Testament. I think in those seven years, I was able to systematically go through the Old Testament in English about 49 times, and I think the New Testament about 87 times. And I shared this with the young people last night. And then I began to write out the scriptures. Have you ever done that? Oh, I tell you, do you know that the king in the Old Testament mm -hmm. had to write out the law and the prophets, the law, yeah, the law, not sure the prophets or the writings, I think it was the law, he had to write out the whole law by hand. So mm -hmm. you say, are you the king? No, I am the child of the king. Isn't that great? Yeah. And this is, uh, I began to do that 40 years ago. I said to the young people last night, uh, if you, if you take the 7,957 verses in the New Testament, if you take 13 verses every day, uh, every 13 months or, uh, or so, you've written out the whole of the New Testament by hand. And uh, it's just an incredible encouragement, the same with the Old Testament. You see, uh, if you don't know who God is, you will never be able to figure out what God is able to do. Mm. If you don't know what God has said, uh, you never will be able to uh, figure out um, what God, uh, how God has been able to work in the lives of people. And, and brother and sister, let me just be absolutely uh, um, 
transparent with you this morning. A friend of mine uh, said um, some time ago, I always love to say to people now, I want to be absolutely honest with you. And he turned to me and he said, he's a pastor. He said, you shouldn't say that. So I said, oh dear me, you know, what, what did I say wrong? He said, if you say, oh, I want to be absolutely honest with you, it means that you haven't been honest up to this point. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you're just one of these typical red Canadians. <laughs> and so I said, so I, I'm so sorry. I said, I didn't, I said, you know my heart. I said, so what do you think I should say? He said, you should say, I, should, I want to be absolutely transparent with you. So I said, oh, so that means I haven't been transparent up to this point. <laughs> so I said, oh, I just get out of here. <laughs> but let me just tell you something, uh, brother and sister, and we're going to look at this this morning. You know, we don't have time. I wish we had a week of uh, uh, lectures or sessions on learning the language of prayer because it's so deep. And we know so much about the scriptures, but the scriptures know so little about us, you know. I mean, it's just a tragic thing. And uh, if we want to learn the language of prayer, what needs to happen is that that which God is saying about prayer needs to become part of our lives. Because you see, we can't take people further spiritually than we are ourselves. We can only impart to people that which we possess. And I said to the young people last night, you know, there was a reason why Jesus said, uh, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Because he has got no other hands than our hands, and no other lips than our lips. And you know, God don't need us. <laughs> he can do his work far better without us. If you ever think you're indispensable, you're going to be in deep trouble very soon. And you remember Elijah in the Old Testament, when after the incredible reality of what happened in Mount Carmel, and and Elijah had to fled for his life. Things didn't work out the way that he thought it would. And he missed it. <laughs> you know. And uh, he found himself sitting under the juniper tree. And God came to him and said, So what's going on with you, Elijah? And do you remember Elijah said, uh, uh, I'm the only one left. Mm. Do you know what the Hebrew language said? I love the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language said, God said to him, So what? <laughs> That's exactly what it means. And then God said, and there's seven others. And have, now, you know, the Lord don't need us. Brother and sister, I'm amazed that, that God allows us to do what we do. And Oswald Chambers said, if you know what God is going to do, He's not going to do it. <laughs> but we can put ourselves in a position where we are at God's disposal. That when the wind of the Spirit of God will come, we can find ourselves going into the depths of the oceans of His love. Now here's the issue, and we're going to explore prayer this morning as it relates to intimacy with God and those things. You cannot separate the answer of prayer from that which God is going to do in your own life. And the essence of prayer, if I may say this to you just at the outset, Brother and sister, the essence of prayer is not to receive thousands of things from God, which is possible. I mean, George Mueller of Bristol, the great man of prayer, with 85,000 answers to prayer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two books written about his prayer life. The first one at the title, 35,000 answers to prayer in 24 hours. I mean, can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> now we look at the title, 50,000 answers to prayer. That took him longer than 24 hours to see God answering those prayers. You know the longest that he prayed for someone? 63 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know when that person became a Christian? Three weeks after George Mueller died. And someone asked George Mueller one day, he said, what is it about your life? And he rose to his feet. He was an amazing man. And he rose to his feet. He said, there was a moment when George Mueller died. He said, I died to my own ambitions. I died to my own desires. I died to my own reputation. He, was, he said, there was a day when God came and put the sentence of death upon the self-life. And so they said, so how does it work with you as it relates to intimacy with God? And he said, I live in the inner chamber. My life is a life of communion and fellowship with God. 
He said, I fall asleep praying. He said, I wake up praying. Mm -hmm. He said, my life. And someone asked him, one day and said, Mr. Mueller, how many hours do you spend in prayer? And he refused to answer it. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, the only thing I can tell you is that I seldom go through an hour without praying. I love that, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul came to us in the uh, New Testament and said, pray without ceasing. <coughs> And people come to me because we've been doing this stuff in more than 30 countries, uh, taking pastors and leaders to prayer summits and spend four days with them in prayer. And in some places, the overwhelming interest that's so unbelievable that we've sat with five or six thousand pastors in some countries who want to learn the language of prayer. And started a Monday afternoon with them and all day Tuesday and Wednesday is a day of prayer and fasting. And and then we finish on Thursday, and they're always excited about Wednesday when they said, Oh, Gerard's going to teach us about prayer and fasting. And then after the conference, the uh, prayer summit is over, because you know, if you can't get through to God, I mean, how are you going to get through to people? Mm. Amen. Yeah. That's why someone once said, He that often speaks to God about people will often speak to people about God. Yeah. And so when we came to the end and they say, okay, so they came and they said, so why did you, why did you take us through the day of prayer on Wednesday? And what we were doing. And you know what I say to them? Because they say, oh, you took us through the day of prayer and fasting. There was no food on Wednesday. And they said, so why did you do that? I said, well, there's a biblical truth about it. They said, that's that the only reason. I said, no. They said, what was the other reason? I said, we didn't have enough money to give you food, you know. <laughs> so said, oh, this is all funny, you know. But listen. This is so immense. Brother and sister, here's the essence. The essence of prayer is not for us to get a whole bunch of things from God. True as that may be, the essence of prayer is to get to know God. Mm. Mm. <coughs> That's the essence. That's why Jesus was able to say, Father, I thank you that you always listen to me. Imagine that. Can you imagine having intimacy and the levels of the presence of God where he was able to say, I thank you that you always listen to me. Let me give you one of the greatest statements in the prayer life of Christ that came from his lips. You say, where is it? It's in the Gospel of John. He prayed in John 17 and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son so that the Son also may glorify you. And and then it almost seems that there's a pause within the context or the construction of the Greek language when he made that statement and he said, glorify the Son so that the Son may also glorify you. And then it just seems in the depth of the deity of the Son of God's life, that he almost stood back and then he made the statement and he said, Father, he said, glorify me with the glory which I had while I was with you. There's no deeper than that that you can go. And that's what we're going to explore. It's just a great privilege for you to, for us to do. And our time is very limited. Monday morning, if you are free on Monday morning, what time do we? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock on Monday morning, if you are free, we're coming together in this room. And I want to take some of these Old Testament concepts as it relates to prayer. Uh, you know, there are 11 uh, Hebrew words in the Old Testament that speaks about prayer. And I'm not going to butt you with all those concepts. But there are 11 Hebrew words that speaks about prayer. I call them the 11 Amazons of Old Testament Scripture as it relates to intimacy with God. And brother and sister, out of those 11, 11 amazing words flows a multitude of other words that is coming to the surface that speaks about prayer. And they are not the 11 words, but they flow out of those words as it relates to prayer. And when you study those words, let me give an example. Uh, Abram. I've just been going through Genesis and in, my, in my quiet times and writing out Genesis. And every time when, when, every time when God spoke in Genesis, I wrote the words out in red. You know, God spoke 99 times in Genesis. You want to understand the Old Testament prayer? You say, what is it? God spoke, man responded, and in between those two there's a thing called intimacy with God. 
And Abram, God spoke to him 56 times out of the book of Genesis. Fascinating. And here's another word. It's not one of the 12, but it flows out of those rivers, these little creeks and streams flowing out of a vocabulary of the Old Testament. Abram stood before the Lord. Great concept of prayer. Virtually every time when he moved, guess what he did? He built an altar. And he worshipped God. And so if you're free on Monday morning at 9 o'clock, we're going to come together. Uh, so if you are retired or if you have your own business and you can make it or so, or if you're unemployed, you need prayer, you know. <laughs> so we can, and that's what we're going to do uh, on Monday morning. The Old Testament is in unreal. Can I just say this to you? You know, those 11 Hebrew words in the Old Testament, three times in the Old Testament, the prophets when they prophesy about the coming of the Messiah, because you say, the coming of the Messiah was what? The coming of the Messiah was the manifestation and the revelation of intimacy with God. And three times in the Old Testament, when they prophesy about Jesus that was going to come, three times they use one of those Hebrew words for prayer, and as they prophesy about Jesus coming, you know what they do? They called him in the Hebrew language a prayer. And so when the Spirit of God came upon Christ and at his baptism in the Gospel of Luke and, and Matthew and John, uh, the Bible says in Luke's Gospel he was praying and his whole life became a life of intimacy with God. And would you allow me to say to you something this morning? We don't have a clue about the prayer life of Jesus. Do you know the three and a half years when he ministered on this planet? Everything that we find in the four Gospels, brother and sister, can probably be done in about a period of eight weeks. Everything that he said, he spoke 47 times in public, 24 times he was preaching, because preaching challenges the world, 23 times he was teaching, teaching informs the mind. You see, we are born with a character uh, but, uh, with a personality, but God is building on Christian character. And everything that Jesus said, and probably did, from the four Gospels, we know he did a lot more, but from the four Gospels, could probably have been done in a period of eight weeks. How long was he here? Three and a half years. Ah, you see what happened in between all those other times? Huh? It's a life of intimacy with God. One of my uh, heroes, uh, we give ten of his books to pastors all over the world. Um, uh, it's a man with the name of Dr. Andrew Murray. I wish I could give you those ten books. <laughs> he wrote 48 books. Absolute surrender. What does it mean to be totally abandoned to God? What does it mean for the Spirit of God not just to be resident in our lives but to become president? Mm -hmm. Sold out. What does it mean when my life and its relationships has become at God's disposal? What does it mean when my mind and its thoughts is when I'm saturated with the exalted life of Christ? What does it mean when my body and its instincts become this incredible temple of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean when Robert Murray McChain, the old Puritan, said, how can the Holy Spirit in you criticize the Holy Spirit in me? What does it mean when McChain of Scotland said, so much of my time of praying is preparing myself how to pray? What does it mean when Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, said, I just don't want to be informed by Scripture, but I want to be inflamed mm. by the depth of it. Mm. And here's the manifestation of his life. And he hardly, if I may say this to you this morning, Christ hardly spoke about prayer that wasn't answered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So how can you say that? Because prayer was the fulfilling of his understanding of the will of the Father. You see, if you pray in the will of God, the answer is always yes. Maybe not the way you're going to want it. Maybe not today. And sometimes the answer is delayed. And the reason when the answer is delayed, brother and sister, what is happening is that there are things that God needs to teach us so that He can prepare us for the answer. Tomorrow morning in Sunday school classes, we're going to look at this thing of, the, of Elijah, you know, in the Old Testament, um, when uh, James said in James chapter 5, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. And, and then look at the life of Elijah. And now God spoke to him and said, go and stand before the king and say to the king, there's not going to be rain except on my word. And so he went and he stood in front of the king and people would say, wow, isn't this amazing? God spoke to the prophet Elijah. Ah, brother and sister, listen here. For three months, three years and six months, there was no rain. Do you think God said to Elijah, Elijah, we're heading for Mount Carmel in three years and six months. Elijah, why don't you take a long vacation and in about three years and five months, I called you back to come here. No, brother and sister, for three years and six months, he was in the school of prayer. And we are so terrible, you know, we try to take these shortcuts. Hmm. God said he doesn't work like that. And it's immense, you know, this whole concept. I better stop because we're never going to stop. Listen, I want us to spend some time in prayer and I want us to get into, into the scriptures uh, as it relates to what we are going to deal with here. Uh, I've got a clock, isn't this great? You <laughs> 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 say, uh, you say, is, is, is that, that all that you are? No, I don't. <coughs> But this is going to help us. So what we are going to do, we're going to spend some time in prayer. Uh, if you need to go to the washroom, then go during that time of prayer. Because then we're just going to get into these passages and this systematic work, work it through. But let's spend some time in prayer. This is what I would like you to do. Can we break up in groups of four? We've got chairs here. And this is what I would like you to do. Uh, and we're doing it tomorrow night at our prayer summit here in the church. Break up in groups of four in different places. You can grab your chair and walk. You don't have to grab your bed and walk. And the guy said, you grab your chair and go into a different corner. And then we're going to spend some time in prayer. You know, uh, Janice and myself, uh, Janice is not here because our daughter is getting married in June 16th. And uh, I'm bankrupt, by the way. <laughs> we only have one. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, uh, um, so Janice is with me, but when we just got married, Janice and myself, this is what we did. We would break people up in groups of four, and sometimes we would stand and we would hold hands and we would pray, uh, pray together, and then and then and we were just married, and so she was always on my right hand, and so we'd be in these groups. And every time when we come to the end of the segment of prayer, and uh, she's here, and I would give her free squeezes to tell her that I really love her. <laughs> and uh, one night we were doing this in a place and uh, Janice was on my right and there was this elderly man probably in his late 80s uh, s standing next to me in theological terms I would be allowed to say he was ready to push up daisies but it's not as bad as that <laughs> and he was standing on, standing on, my, on my left and uh, so we prayed together and when we came to the end I wanted to give my wife his free squeezes and I messed it up <laughs> and I gave the old guy three squeezes. He said, how did you know he was old? I heard the bones. <laughs> <laughs> and when it was all done, he was okay. He looked at me and he said, so young man, what was those three squeezes? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I better fall back into my reformed theology. And I said, well... Maybe it was the father of a son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> anyway, got away with it. And so, so I don't want you to do that now. But uh, we're going to spend some time in prayer. So find three other people. And this is what I want you to do. Let me give you some insight. I want you to turn to those people. And I want you to ask them, is there anything that I can pray for you about? And we're going to share not long, extended uh, explanation of needs. Just take a minute or so. And so, you know, if you pray for me this morning, uh, this is the way that I want you to pray. And we spend some time in prayer. And then I will close it, 
and we jump right into the material in the first session. So can we do that? So find uh, three